Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. A lovely sunny day it is today. Pete, can you come do the notices first, please? Yeah. <coughs> yes, morning to you, Paul. And as you see, Carl is leading the service this morning. I assume it's another fruit of the spirit. Yeah, there we go. So we'll be well fed, yeah. <coughs> Gem for the children. This evening, 6 pm, there will be a video link. Oh, there will be communion during the service and should be refreshments after the evening service. In the week, Tuesday, uh, 7 pm, prayer and Bible study here. And then it says, Coronation Special Evenings at on Wednesday, Boys Club, 6 p.m. And Friday, Girls Brigade, 6.30 p.m. So uh, we'll find out what's going to happen there. Perhaps there'll be a crowning of a king and a queen. Whatever. Then next Sunday, the 7th of May, in the morning, 10.30 a.m., it's Roger. There will be jam for the children, and then, uh, then after the service, there is the coron coronation bring and share lunch. And then after you've been well fed there, it's over to the Methodist Church, 3 p.m. if you're able, for their join with the, their neighbor and others in the village for the coronation celebration service. You also see, don't forget to pick up one of these, a lot of lists of things going on in May and June. It's starting to get busy. <coughs> Streets for Prayer this week, South Avenue, Blackgate Road and Wallace Street. For the UEC we're praying for all the churches and their governments this week. And the missionary focus is good news for everyone. I think that's all, thank you. Psalm 138, verses 1 to 3 says, I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods I will sing your praise. I will bow down towards your holy temple and will praise your name with your unfailing love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame, surpasses your fame. When you called, you answered me. Heavenly Father, we welcome we come before you with grateful hearts. Thank you for the blessings of another day and the opportunity to worship you. We ask that you guide and direct our thoughts, words and actions during this service. May the songs we sing, the prayers we offer and the message we hear be pleasing to you and inspire us to live lives that honour and glorify you. Amen. Now we come for our time of intercessory prayer. Lord, you are our shepherd, and we pray that you will protect us from all danger by keeping watch over us. We ask that you guide us towards greener pastures, where we can be nourished by your word and lead us to be near still waters where well, we can be refreshed by your love. So Lord, you are our shepherd, and we pray for our church leaders, that they too may care and lead us by following the example of the love and service you demonstrate in your ministry. Also Lord, we pray that for the world that has given us an inheritance, on the understanding that we would care for it as shepherds care for their flocks. 
Now she to teach us to look after our beautiful planet and care for it wisely. By sharing its gifts more fairly and working together with all its inhabitants to ease all its sufferings of Lord, you are our shepherd. And we pray for our families and friends who need to hear the voice of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, who knows every one of them by name, who offers rest to the weary and salvation to sinners, and life eternal to all those who accept him into their lives. Lord, you are our shepherd. You're the shepherd who seeks out the lost and the sick. We pray for those we know who have lost in illness and ask you to reassure them with the knowledge that you're watching over them in their suffering and that many are praying for their recovery. Lord, you are our shepherd. And we thank you for this time we have shared in prayer and thanksgiving. In the week ahead, Lord, we ask that you lead us down the streets of our towns and villages and guide us safely, safely along the roads we travel. Lord, you are our shepherd. We thank you for the offering today. And then you put on our hearts how to spend that money wisely for your church and your community. Heavenly Father, we ask you to accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we go into our third thing, which is, the Lord is my shepherd. Page 619 in the Church Bible. 
Do good to your servants according to your word, Lord. Teach me knowledge and good judgment, for I trust your commands. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. You are good, and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. Though the arrogant have smeared me with lies, I keep your precepts with all my heart. Their hearts are callous and unfeeling, but I delight in your law. <coughs> it was good for me to be afflicted, so that I might learn your decrees. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. This is the word of God. Just in that short passage, the word good was used five times. And that's what I want to talk today about. One of the fruits of the Spirit is called goodness. I don't mind telling you, I struggled with this sermon on two accounts. The first, because I believe this fruit is so close to the last one we looked at, the last one, kindness. But after many hours of looking at a blank screen, God put on my heart what to write. And secondly, after researching about goodness, I started to question myself on how good I actually am. So maybe this sermon is not for you. And God has put it on my heart to show me what goodness is. But as it's all written out, you've got to listen to it anyway. <laughs> so the Bible says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now the fruit is an outward action of the inner nature. So when you see these nine traits in someone, in someone's personality, we know that they are a godly person. But we should also remember that there is only one fruit, but it has nine flavours. You cannot pick and choose what flavour you want. You can't say, I take joy, but I'll pass some patience to that. It's a package deal. Now we tend to put people into categories as well, don't we? You've got good people and bad people. So I'm going to call out some names. And you tell me if they're good or bad. <coughs> and I'll fit that. Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> Bin Laden. Mother Teresa. Joseph Stalin. Robin Hood, who <laughs> stole from the rich and gave to the poor. Was he good or bad? <laughs> you see, goodness is not clear cut. So as we talk about goodness, I want to make three statements to help us understand the spiritual fruit of goodness. The first one, I want to be good. As I said before, it would be easy to pass this fruit over. And that is because of another re reason. And that is because the word good, or goodness, is quite weak in our vocabulary. We use the word good so often. Here are some examples. Good morning. Good night. Good job. Good game. Good luck. Good hair done. Good looking. Looking good. Good to see you. Feeling good. And if you've got all them, good for you. <laughs> From the beginning of our lives, our parents tell us to be good. Now when I was a teenager, I went through a rebellious time. 
And now it's hard to believe, but I did. I can always recall my mum saying, when I left to go and play with my mates outside, now be good and have fun. At that time, I used to think to myself, how can I be good and have fun? They don't go together. Now, wanting to be good is a worthy goal. George Orwell once wrote, on the whole, human beings want to be good, but not too good, and not quite all the time. So let's start with a definition of goodness. I believe goodness is doing the right thing for the right reason. You can do the right thing, but if you're doing it for the wrong reason, that's not goodness. If we look at Matthew chapter 6 verses 1 to 4, it says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites of the synagogues and on the streets, to be honoured by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. <coughs> so that your giving may be in secret. Also, going to church is a really good thing, isn't it? But make sure you're doing it for the right reason. Are you here to meet and worship? And just to show people what a good Christian you are. Goodness is doing the right thing for the right reasons. Now the Bible is also called a good book and that's because it has a lot to say about goodness. The Greek word for good is agathos and it appears over 250 times in the New Testament. The Hebrew word for good is tov. And that appears over 350 times in the Old Testament. Because it's used so often, perhaps we'll wonder what goodness actually is. But we don't have to wonder what good is. Because God gives us guidelines. In the prophet, in the book from the prophet Micah, he wrote. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So let's just have a look at that passage. So to act justly means you treat people with fairness, honesty and integrity. Some say honesty is the best policy. But for a follower of Jesus, honesty is the only policy. Then he says, loving mercy means showing mercy to those who need your mercy. Now the word mercy in Hebrew literally means unexpected kindness. Now a couple of weeks ago I mentioned that true kindness isn't being kind to someone who can repay your kindness. That's just swapping. True kindness is shown to those who have no way of paying your, in paying your kindness. Then in my case it says, love mercy. Justice and mercy both direct us how to live in relationship with each other. And at the end of that passage is the best good of all. Walk humbly with God. You see, you can't approach God with arrogance or by making demands that he treat you in a certain way. When subjects approach a king, they had to bow down. 
And if the king directed them to stand and speak, they could look into his eyes. And that's how we should approach the king of kings, humbly with our heads bowed. But there's a great promise that says, humble yourselves, therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. And you'll find that in 1 Peter. And we're also told that because of the blood of Jesus, we may boldly approach the throne of grace. So based on God's guidelines there in Micah, how good are you? If you think you're very good, then pay close attention to the next truth. <clears throat> the second truth, I can't be good. We think we're good because we compare ourselves to others. We look at our neighbours, friends and our family. And if we act a bit better than they do, we feel we're fairly good people. When you're using the wrong standard. You see, God's standard is perfect goodness and complete holiness. If you use the wrong standard, then all comparisons are useless. Now you've all read the Sermon on the Mount and you probably try to live by their principles. And if you do, you think you're a pretty good person. But after Jesus gave all the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, he talks about murder, divorce, revenge and loving your enemies and much more. Now some people use these as a checklist check this, to check their obedience in those areas. And if they tick all their boxes, they think, oh, I'm a pretty good person. But don't miss what Jesus says later. He says, be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You see, some people can be good most of the time. And most of the people can be good some of the time. But no person can be perfectly good all of the time. So before we start talking about how good we are, let's look at these words from the Bible. It's written in Romans 3.12 and 7.18. There is no one who does good, not even one. I know that nothing good lives in me. That is my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. <coughs> so who can relate to that? I believe all of us desire to be good and do good. But we have this anchor, and it's called a sinful nature. And it just keeps dragging you back. You see, we want to be good, but we cannot be good on our own. So what is the solution? Well, the solution is found in our third tree. And the solution is Jesus. He's not only good for me, he's good in me. In Mark 10, <clears throat> a rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Before Jesus answered his question, he posed his own question. He asked, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Jesus did not say, don't call me good. He accepted the title. And then said, only God is good. Jesus is good because he is God. And because he's God, he is good. The Bible affirms many times that God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Psalm 34, verse 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. 
Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Psalm 86 says, You are forgiven the good, O Lord, abounding in love to all who call you. And we read in Psalm 106, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. See, when you come to Christ, Jesus took up residence in your heart. He took up that residence through the person of the Holy Spirit. So now you have access, access to this divine goodness. But it's not your goodness. It's the goodness of Jesus shining out through you. Let me try to illustrate this from a passage in Exodus. Exodus 33, 18. Moses is on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments from God. And he makes a strange request of God. He says, show me your glory. In other words, Moses says, I want to see you, see you face to face, God. God said, if you looked at my face, you would die on the spot. But here's what I will do. I will let you, I will let my goodness pass by you. Moses asked to see God's glory. And God said, his glory is best seen in his goodness. And when the goodness of God passed by Moses, he was hidden in the cleft of a rock. But even a glimpse of the afterglow of God's goodness made the face of Moses shine and radiate. Moses wasn't aware his face was shining until he went back down to his people. And they said, Moses, your face is shining. Moses had to wear a vow to cover the radiance that come from seeing God's electrifying goodness. Now in the New Testament, Paul compares us to Moses. He points out that Moses' radiance faded. But he kept wearing the vow so people would think he was still shining. But we don't have to wear a vow. He writes, and we who with unveiled faces all reflect, reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with, in, with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Just as the radiance of God was shining out of Moses the power of goodness of Jesus can shine out through our lives. We don't have to wear it out Instead, God wants us to shine. Walking in the Spirit is a daily, continual experience of being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. Jesus' personality was full of goodness. And when I allow his personality to fill my personality, goodness will be seen in me. Now at funerals, you often hear preachers say, he was a good man, or she was a good woman. So what is the key of being recognised as a good man or a good woman? Well, we find this description of one of the early Christians named Barnabas. The Bible says he, Barnabas, was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit. Now those are not two separate descriptions. Barnabas was a good man because he was full of the Holy Spirit. Before Jesus was crucified, he promised the disciples he would send, send them the Holy Spirit to take his place. Jesus says, I have been with you, but he will be in you. Before Pentecost, the disciples could only watch and try to imitate his personality and his actions. But after the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Spirit of Jesus. No longer did they have to try to imitate Jesus. 
His personality was dwelling within them. And we have the same resources for us today. If you concentrate on allowing the Holy Spirit of Jesus to fill you every day, then you will be a good man or a good woman. See, God's plan for your life is that you will perform good works. The Bible says, for we are good workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And that's written in Ephesians 2. Also in the Bible, it says in Ephesians, that we are saved by grace through faith unto good works, which means that our salvation ushers us into a life of goodness. Good works can never earn salvation, but they are evidence of our salvation. If you are a Christian, you will be doing good things, but you can't boast about that, because it's not your goodness, it's God's goodness. God's works is not the root of salvation. They are the fruit of salvation. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6, 16, Let your light shine before men. Meaning, do good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So how can you know if you are truly saved? And there is good evidence in your life and your salvation. Well, when people look at you and the goodness you show, are they giving you the credit? Are they giving you the glory? Or are they rightfully turning and giving glory and credit to God? Because that will be the best example of the good works this sermon was talking about. Now our final thought. Goodness alone won't get you to heaven. Only Jesus can do that. In Titus chapter 3, verses 4 to 5. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God appeared, he saved us. Not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of the regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. And that is the word of the Lord today. We should bow our heads in prayer. <coughs> now Father, help us live your goodness and kindness each day. Remind us that our actions express who we are even more than our words. May we love as you love. Let us be good to those who wish us on. Forgive those who need forgiveness. And reach out in kindness to all we meet, so they can experience the unconditional love of God. Amen. We will now have our final hymn, which is Amazing Grace.
commitment at the moment to ourselves. We look at our hearts and think about why we are really here today. Are we here just to be good Christians or are we here to worship the Lord and sing his praises? This is our moment. time together we thank you that you have shown us what the fruit of the spirit is Lord that we can't take one without the other we need your mind to grow inside us Lord to radiate your love and show your goodness for us we ask all this in your name Amen